Well, good afternoon. My name is Tom Palmer. I'm a senior fellow here at the Cato Institute. And it's my very distinct pleasure to welcome you to the F.A. Hayek Auditorium of the Institute for a discussion of two new books on one of the most interesting and stimulating and centrally important intellectuals of the 20th century, the man for whom this auditorium was named F.A. Hayek. Next month will be the 60th anniversary of the publication of Hayek's most famous or most popular book, The Road to Serfdom, in 1944. It represented a real turning point in the 20th century in the battle between collectivist totalitarianism and individualist liberalism, with liberal un liberalism understood in the classical sense of the term. And so this seemed a fitting occasion to sponsor a discussion of Hayek's contributions to knowledge and to the defense of liberty and even civilization itself. We have the authors of both books here with us, as well as a distinguished commentator, all of whom I will introduce shortly. Before doing so, however, I'd like to note that in the lobby outside, we have some photos and other mementos of Hayek's involvement with the work of the Cato Institute, uh, and also to mention what a huge influence he had on Cato's work and mission. And that influence was not only institutional, it was personal as well. Now, I'll indulge in just one example. I recall uh, quite a few years ago attending a public lecture that he gave, and I was really struck by the answer he gave to one of the questions. And it was the form of the answer rather than the content that was so striking and made such an impact on me. A question had been posed to him, and he answered in his very distinctive Austro-British accent, uh, something like the following. He said, I take it from the questions that you believe such and such. The fellow said, yes. And he said, hmm, I also held that opinion for about 50 years. But lately, I've been thinking about it a great deal and have concluded it was a fundamental error. And I thought, if I ever get to be that old, I want to be just like that. <laughs> Always opening to rethinking important questions, listening to critics, and being willing to modify cherished beliefs because the fundamental commitment is to finding or at least groping after the truth. Let me turn to introducing then our presenters. Um, Alan Ebenstein is the author of Hayek's Journey, The Mind of Friedrich Hayek. I should point out these books are available at Amazon.com and LFB.com as well. Uh, Alan received his PhD in political philosophy from the London School of Economics, which is where Hayek taught for many years. He's the author of a number of books, notably on the works of Edwin Kanan, a very important figure at the London School of Economics, who revived a great deal of influence in the work of Adam Smith and was very influential when Hayek uh, went to the London School of Economics. He's also the author of a companion volume to this one called Friedrich Hayek, A Biography. He has taught economics and political theory at uh, Santa Barbara and at Antioch University and is currently a private businessman. Bruce Caldwell, who's the author of Hayek's Challenge, an intellectual biography of F.A. Hayek, is the Joe Rosenthal Excellence Professor in the Department of Economics at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. He's the author of Beyond Positivism, Economic <coughs> Methodology in the 20th Century, and of many articles in economics journals. He's also, notably, the general editor of the collected works of F.A. Hayek, uh, published, like this book, by the University of Chicago Press. And finally, our commentator this afternoon is Dick Army, a rather well-known figure in this town, as he was until rather recently majority leader of the House of Representatives. He's currently serving as co-chairman of Citizens for a Sound Economy. Before coming to Washington, D.C., however, he was chairman of the Department of Economics at the University of North Texas, and I think it's reasonable to say that Dr. Army is the finest economist ever to serve as the majority leader of the House of Representatives. <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, each of our uh, presenters to introduce to you some of the results of their years of research and thought on this important uh, thinker, uh, followed by Dr. Army's comments and then general discussion and questions from the floor. Why don't we start with Alan? All right. Mm -hmm. sit here. Mm -hmm. Up here, please. Okay, 
Well, it's a pleasure to be able to introduce some comments on Friedrich Hayek. Uh, Hayek was a great admirer of the Cato Institute, and in fact, one of his last letters uh, when he was very old in 1990 was uh, to Ed Crane, and writing on the collapse of communism and of the Berlin Wall, Hayek, uh, Hayek wrote that he could not be more pleased by the, quote, the ultimate victory of our side in the long dispute of the principles of the free market, and will at the moment only say that I hardly expected to live to experience this. Hayek is someone whose lifetime spanned almost the entire 20th century. He was born in 1899. He died in 1992. He had an incredibly productive career, uh, starting in the 1920s and extending really through the 1980s. And as Tom indicated, his major work, or the work for which he is most well-known popularly, is The Road to Serfdom, which was originally published in England in 1944. Uh, I think it was this month, however. We're already in February, and I believe, was it published in February or March? Do you, do you know? It was March. All right, well, Tom, Tom knows better than I do. And uh, it was subsequently published in the United States um, six or seven months later in the fall and uh, was a great, a great success. Most of my focus and my comments will be on Hayek's political thought and political philosophy. That's the area of my own background. And uh, it's something that I, I think that his work in this area uh, is really among his most lasting and permanent work. Uh, and um, in any event, after the uh, road to serfdom in 1944, Hayek followed up uh, his work in political philosophy with three other major volumes, which really uh, were his primary focus for the next 40 years, which were in 1960, The Constitution of Liberty, from 1973 to 1979, Law, Legislation, and Liberty, and then a work published in 1988, The Fatal Conceit, The Errors of Socialism. I think that the fundamental aspect of Hayek's thought with respect to socialism and the difference between free market capitalism and socialism was that socialism was wrong on the facts. And I think that this is a very important aspect of his thought. It's not that if humanity were good enough, wouldn't it be a great thing if socialism could be realized? If only humanity were more altruistic, socialism could be realized. Those were the sorts of arguments that were used for and against socialism earlier in the 20th century. But I think that Hayek's contribution, stemming in large part from his uh, teacher and mentor Ludwig von Mises, was that the fundamental dispute between socialism and capitalism was not an ethical dispute, but was a factual dispute over which system would best deliver, literally be able to deliver the goods of economic productivity. When he originally put forward his ideas in the 1930s and 40s that socialism was not the most effective way of producing goods and services, he was, of course, ridiculed. Um, however, time, as we, we've all seen, has proven Hayek right. And I think that that's a very revelatory finding because what it indicates is that what the current consensus is about an issue can be completely wrong and that what the best minds, the most, uh, the, the most intellectual representatives of certain viewpoints are putting forward as the way that the world is, is in, fact, um, is in fact not the way necessarily that the world is. So I think that Hayek's idea that, that socialists were wrong about the facts was absolutely crucial to his comprehensive thought and is one of the conclusions that in his final work, The Fatal Conceit, he emphasized. Whence does Hayek's influence stem? I think that it in large part stems from his utopian aspect. And sometimes Hayek is seen as a rather uh, stiff, dour figure, very precise, very, uh, very scholarly, and not necessarily a visionary and a utopian. But I don't think that's correct, because I think that Hayek was fundamentally a utopian. He wrote in Law, Legislation, and Liberty, uh, which was his major work in political philosophy following the Constitution of Liberty, that it is not to be denied that to some extent the guiding model 
of the overall order will always be an utopia, something to which the existing situation will be only a distant approximation and which many people will regard as wholly impractical. Yet it is only by constantly holding up the guiding concept of an internally consistent model which could be realized by the consistent application of the same principles that anything like a sorry let's see that anything like a framework for a functioning spontaneous order will be achieved for an effective spontaneous order effective framework for a spon uh, functioning spontaneous order will be achieved so he had this idea that it was very important that there was a a visionary aspect to, uh, to, to political thought and economic thought, and that it's not enough simply to look at piecemeal incremental reform in the sense that he thought that that was how reform is most likely to be achieved in a practical manner. And he certainly was not someone who advocated typically revolutionary or decisive change. But at the same time, it was important that there be some sort of inspirational ideal that would provide people intellectually the opportunity to understand the direction in which the larger system should be moving. He frequently said throughout his career that the purpose of the economist or political philosopher is to make possible what today is politically impossible. And I think that that too is one of the, the cornerstones of Hayek's thought. It's not just this emphasis on facts, it's this emphasis that things truly can be different than the way they are today, that the way we run and operate our societies is not something that's carved in stone, that societies can evolve, they will evolve, and that if we, if we have the right ideals that we can, create, um, we can create better societies. Since I'm going to talk mostly on Hayek's political thought, there were several issues that I thought that would be relevant to current discussion that would, would be worthwhile to discuss as to what Hayek's views would be. Uh, and, and these issues, these five issues, would be one, freedom of association, two, the legalization of drugs, three, a more communitarian and voluntary society, four, diminution of the role and extent of government, and five, expansion of free trade. And there's obviously much uh, interpollination and connection among these. With respect to the idea of freedom of association, I think that Hayek would argue that this is something that is truly being lost in our society or has been lost in our society, and that in the same way that it's inappropriate for government to attempt to micromanage the details of economic product, uh, production, Similarly, it's inappropriate for government to attempt to micromanage people's individual moral decisions in their lifetimes. The essential libertarian principle is that people should be able to do whatever they wish as long as they are not proximately and in the first instance harming someone else. And that includes the ability to associate with individuals with whom individuals feel that they have similar views. Um, I think that the practical emanation of greater emphasis on freedom of association in our system is greater emphasis on decision making at the state and local level. In Law, Legislation, and Liberty, Hayek wrote, discussed the trans, quote, the transformation of local and even regional governments into quasi-commercial corporations competing for citizens. He wrote in the Constitution of Liberty on competition between municipalities. He remarked in an interview, I'm inclined to give the local authorities power which I would deny to the central government because people can vote with their feet against what the local governments do. I think that Hayek's view on the issue of diversity is not so much that all communities have the same sorts of characteristics, but there can be very different sorts of communities in a society in which people in one area can believe and practice differently than people in other areas. And again, I think that the idea of freedom of association is is a very important one and uh, an, an area where Hayek's thought today would find a, 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 a practical emanation. In the area of legalization of drugs, I think that Hayek would be emphatic that adults should be able to do whatever they wish as long as they are not harming someone else. 
And I think that his argument in favor of legalization of drugs would not so much be a prudential one of, of the costs of uh, the war on drugs, but I think rather his argument would be a freedom argument that as much as individuals may decry other individuals' choices, that ultimately it's vital for individuals to be able to develop their own uh, moral standards and moral judgments and make the decisions that they think are best for them even if they're wrong in that judgment, that freedom is the overriding principle. Uh, and uh, basically it's something that um, Hayek's view in this area was certainly that uh, it, it's inappropriate for government to attempt to uh, micromanage people's individual lives and that as much as possible individuals should be able to make those decisions themselves. He also in the road to serfdom talked about that morality only has value when individuals have the opportunity to choose. It is in the act of choosing that people develop their humanity and that by denying people the right to make choices, he says, the people, the person who is made to do the good thing in all instances has, has no moral merit. In the area of a more communitarian and, uh, and voluntary society, I definitely would have favored a uh, more voluntary society with more social services being provided at local and state levels rather than at the federal level, the privatization and competition in the area of provision of social services, the voluntary and charitable aspect of these services, and it's something that he saw that as a better society, and it's something that when he talked about this communitarian element of trying to do things at the local and state levels, he said that to re-entrust the management of most service activities of government to smaller units would probably lead to the revival of a communal spirit, that it creates a better society when instead of trying to do things at a national and federal level, we do them at a state and local and voluntary level. This is very related, it's very interrelated to the idea of uh, trying to reduce the role and extent of government, government in general, particularly at a national level. I think that where we could look for progress in the long run of are we moving more toward a Hayekian, Hayekian society would be is government percentage of gross national product declining? Are the pages in the Federal Register each year being reduced? Is there less regulation? Basically, his view was that if you allow people to have more freedom in their lives, that it will create a much better society as well as be more, uh, be more economically optimal. These are obviously reinforcing goals. If the percentage of the uh, gross national product that the federal government is diminishing, then that's going to be leading to more activity at local and voluntary levels and once again a more, more communitarian society. Finally, in the area of uh, expanding free trade, I think that Hayek would have been completely opposed to efforts to restrict free trade at any level, particularly those individuals in the political uh, those individuals who believe that somehow we're not benefiting people around the world to allow free trade to the maximum extent simply just don't know how economies operate and that it's something that's completely not just unjust to our own people and depriving them of a better livelihood but so much more so really in many respects depriving people around the world of a better livelihood it's something that by creating the broadest markets possible that uh, by creating the broadest possible markets possible, there'll be the, 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 greatest, the greatest economic growth. Well, I had better let Bruce comment. Bruce is, of course, the general editor of Hayek's Collected Works and has just written an excellent book, which I'm currently reading, Hayek's Challenge. And, um, but, but to conclude my own comments, Hayek was once again, I think, primarily a, a visionary and utopian philosopher in many respects in his political philosophy. And what he wrote in the 1940s, the late 1940s, when the prospects for freedom seemed dark, was that we must make the building of a free society once more an intellectual adventure, a deed of courage. What we lack is a liberal utopia, using liberal in the classical 19th century uh, uh, definition of the term. What we lack is a liberal utopia, a truly liberal radicalism.
The main lesson which the true liberal must learn from the socialist, from the success of the socialists, is that it was their courage to be utopian which is daily making possible what only recently was utterly remote. Thank you very much. Which one is it? Is it either one? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, in my remarks today, uh, I'm going to start out just by saying how I first got interested in Hayek, and then I hope to convey at least uh, a little bit to you how that interest ultimately uh, turned into a real fascination. Uh, I didn't come to Hayek as so many people probably in this room and, and others who, who know of his work uh, either as a conservative or a libertarian, although, and I didn't know it at the time, I had libertarian tendencies, but I didn't, I didn't think of myself in those ways. But I came to Hayek as an historian of economic thought. Uh, and my interest as an historian, uh, I think it's easy to, to understand why an historian would, would find Hayek an interesting figure. As Lanny said, he, he lived a long time, 1899 to 1992. He wrote uh, a, a tremendous amount. Uh, there's actually a huge archives uh, at it uh, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. I think it's currently at about 120, uh, 120 boxes at this point. Uh, and he was a very controversial writer, which uh, is an attractive thing for an historian as well, because uh, as a result, he had people who really liked him. He had people who really disliked him. They were offering interpretations. And one of the jobs of an historian is to, is to try to uh, sort through the interpretations, try to figure out which ones might be reasonable, which ones not. Um, but I think what really, uh, really clinched it for me uh, as an historian of economic thought in particular was that Hayek managed to be at the right place at the right time, virtually all of his life. Uh, he, he grew up in uh, Fien de Siecle, uh, Vienna, which was a, a hotbed of intellectual activity uh, in, in Western Europe. Uh, among his, his earliest teacher was uh, Friedrich von Wieser, uh, but soon he came under the sway of Ludwig von Mises. Uh, one of his classmates, uh, people that he took courses with, with Oscar Morgenstern, who went on to be one of the co-developers of, of game theory. Uh, when he finished up his, his time at university, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, another, you may not know all these names, but to economists, these are wonderful names. Uh, each one of them, you know, worthy of, of, and indeed has biographies written about them. Schumpeter gives him uh, letters of introduction to all of the leading American economists. He gets to the United States and meets all of them and manages to sit in on, on Wesley Clare Mitchell's uh, History of Economic Thought class, which I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the significance of, this, of the specific class that he sat in on in a little bit of time. Wesley Clare Mitchell was the, uh, one of the fathers of American institutionalism, uh, a set of views with which uh, Hayek would later contend. Um, when he came back uh, to Vienna, he worked for a while, uh, uh, worked on, on finishing up his degree, and was invited by Lionel Robbins uh, to the London School of Economics to give four lectures in the early 1930s. If you go to the London School of Economics today and find the library, it's the Robbins Library. I mean, this was the, the person who was a very big figure now. He was 30, 31 years old at the time when he invited Hayek uh, over to give these lectures. Hayek ends up staying at the LSE uh, for a number of years, over uh, about 20 years almost. Uh, as soon as he gets there, he gets embroiled in a, in a uh, at the time, academically violent, not physically violent, but a, a violent exchange with John Maynard Keynes. This is before Keynes had written the general theory, but uh, uh, Hayek was already disagreeing with it. Uh, later on, he inter interacts with people like Frank Knight and Oscar Long in the mid-30s. Uh, he invites uh, into his seminar uh, an obscure young uh, philosopher named Karl Popper who he ends up ultimately bringing Popper to the London School of Economics. Not he alone, but he was instrumental in getting uh, Popper his appointment at the London School of Economics. He's also having meetings with people like Karl Polanyi, people outside of economics who are significant thinkers. Uh, after World War II, he starts, uh, he, he is a principal in founding uh, the Mont Pelerin Society. Uh, two of the people that he uh, invites to that are, are George Stigler and Milton Friedman, who would soon become his, uh, his colleagues later at the University of Chicago. So if you were interested, as I am as an historian, in, in trying to come to grips with the development of economics in the 20th century, Hayek is a perfect figure, a vehicle 
for trying to understand how that development took place from a very different point of view from the mainstream view in economics because he typically, as I'll mention a, a bit later, uh, tended to disagree with a lot of, uh, of developments there. So you can understand then how I might get interested. Uh, the fascination part comes uh, as I got deeper into uh, my subject. Uh, I found that trying to tell Hayek's story was extremely difficult. Uh, this is a complex, complex figure uh, who I was trying to figure out. And uh, one of the things that, that I found most challenging about, about Hayek was his constantly changing research topics. Now, we're all trained in the late 20th century or mid to late 20th century when I was trained as specialists, but this is a guy who would just roam all over the map. Uh, he started out as a monetary theorist working within an Austrian tradition of monetary theory. In the 1930s, he switches over and starts his uh, analysis of socialism and the problems with socialism. Uh, as Lanny pointed out, he convinced no one with his analysis, so he thought, well, what I must do is go and, and try to develop a, a, a little bit a broader analysis. And he started what he called his abuse of reason project during the war. One of the books that came out of that was The Road to Serfdom, which everyone knows about, but another is a set of essays, Scientism and the Study of Society, that are uh, incredible essays on uh, the methodology of the social sciences and how we can uh, better understand uh, uh, certain social sciences. Uh, the Road to Serfdom gives, his, gives him his 15 minutes of fame, and he immediately embarks on a totally new project, writing a book uh, that ultimately became uh, The Sensory Order, a book in theoretical psychology, a book that uh, when I first read it, I couldn't make uh, heads nor tails of. It was a difficult book to, to try to figure out what was going on, but just, just the audacity uh, to, to break out and write a book in theoretical psychology when you're known as, a, as, as an economist and also as someone who's uh, contributing to political uh, uh, thought of the day in the road to serfdom uh, uh, was, was quite incredible. Of course, he then goes on and does other things. He goes to the University of Chicago, and that's when he starts his phase when he's working mostly in political theory and political philosophy. Uh, but he's also, again, writing uh, uh, articles on the methodology of science and trying to figure out what it is about certain sciences that make them so hard to handle, so hard to deal with, so hard to get uh, uh, precise predictions from. Uh, here his papers, uh, the theory of complex phenomena or degrees of explanation are some of the standard citations. So I mean the questions that, 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 that I, uh, an historian faces in, in, in that is how, why was he doing it? Why was he making these switches? What was going on in his head to switch from this field to that field? How can you tie that and weave that together to make a plausible story? And I, I found that a challenging uh, uh, thing to do and it was something that, that kept me busy for uh, uh, quite a number of years. Now, further complications were added by the fact uh, that Hayek um, disagreed with just about everybody uh, he came into contact with. I mean, this was not, I don't think in his nature, uh, he just uh, simply disagreed with many people. He, uh, he, he was, if, if, if you want to continue the analogy, the right person at the right time with the wrong ideas, at least that's what everyone else uh, uh, thought. Um, uh, he disavowed, uh, for example, Socialism, when everyone viewed socialism as the middle way, that capitalism had, had collapsed in the Great Depression and that there was totalitarianism of, 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 of fascisms and, and, and communisms on, on, on various fronts, and the middle way was socialism. That was the, he said this is the, the muddle of the middle was his phrase that he used. He, he didn't buy it uh, a bit. Um, when uh, uh, the Keynesian Revolution came along, well, he had actually disavowed the Keynesian Revolution before it started. He had started his arguments with Keynes before the general theory was even written, and uh, indeed, when the general theory came along, he, he didn't even review it. He thought that Keynes was not, uh, you know, someone important enough to, 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 it wasn't quite that. It's actually a fairly complex and rich story, but he, he ended up not even, not even reviewing it. Uh, uh, just time and time again, his, his book on psychology was ignored. Uh, many of his works were viewed as the work of a reactionary or a radical and just not paid attention to. Some of the worst parts of it, I think, for Hayek was, was not so much when people disagreed with him as when they, they just met his work with indifference. What's wonderful, of course, is his response to all of that. Uh, uh, when he finds all of the intelligentsia uh, uh, arrayed against him in various uh, uh, forms, his response is, how can so many supposedly smart people be so wrong? You know, how am I going to show them that, that they're just wrong? So he goes about trying to figure out ways of, of, of showing people the errors of their, of their beliefs. And in, in doing that, um, he made recourse to history. One of the things that I liked about Hayek 
is his, is his use of history in trying to say, this is the origin of these erroneous ideas. He does this particularly in this abuse of reason project. This is why people today keep thinking this way. It, it has its origins back in these old bad ideas that just filtered their way down and now are, are dominating us. And these are some of his arguments that he makes in that essay. And he also uses history to draw on a classical liberal tradition, a Scottish Enlightenment tradition, uh, uh, that he viewed as, as something that had been supplanted by this other tradition that he was trying to revive. And indeed, he played a, a, a very big role in, uh, in, in helping to revive that tradition. Obviously not alone, there was many others doing it, but he, he did play a, an important <coughs> role. Now, in addition to using history, he also asked deep questions about the nature of social reality and why the models that economists were using and the ways of thinking about it then current were missing uh, things about about reality, that, that if you look with a general equilibrium theory at, at the way a market works, it has certain insights, but there's a bunch of things it, it misses, and these are things that are important to the real functioning uh, of a market economy. Um, so he looks at the world and he says, uh, well, actually, the world is different from the way these models have told us they, it, it is, and indeed the models are misleading. And his conclusions that he came up with actually were methodological. And remember, I, I actually started out uh, with at least uh, as much interest in his methodological ideas as, as anything else. Uh, he asked questions about what further was possible in, um, in social science. The, wor the working subtitle of my book, uh, the, the, the subtitle is An Intellectual Biography of F.A. Hayek, and uh, the University of Chicago Press Marketing Department kindly provided me with that subtitle and took away the one that I wanted uh, because they said, well, this, this, is a, this is a better subtitle because you are, it is an intellectual uh, biography, and fair enough. But uh, I also, the working uh, 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 subtitle up until that point was F.A. Hayek and the Limits of Social Science. And I think one of his most profound messages, actually, is that we can do a lot less um, in the world than we hope to, and certainly than, than what we thought we could do back in the age of positivism that he, that he fought in for so long. Um, in telling Hayek's story, I just want to uh, say one last thing uh, about this, the way I structured the book in trying to tell the story, because it might, if, if any of you actually do get it, it, it's a little bit strange. I start out with the Austrian School of Economics. I don't start out with Hayek. And the reason I do this is, is I think it's absolutely essential to understand if you're going to understand Hayek, to understand the tradition in which he was working. Uh, not only to explicate to some extent uh, the Austrian viewpoints, but to, to point out that this was a tradition that was born in battle. Uh, uh, the German historical school and the Austrian economists were fighting about the nature of social science, whether history versus theory is more important. And many of those debates of those early uh, days are echoed in debates uh, that took place within economics about the relative importance of theory versus empirical work. So it's, it's important for that aspect, but also to see where Hayek was coming from. But equal, equally important, uh, Hayek uh, came from a tradition that was working against socialist ideas and positivist ideas. Uh, these are philosophical ideas, the, the latter. And crucially, within, within the Austrian viewpoint, socialism and positivism were linked. Now, this is interesting because among economists, especially after Milton Friedman, uh, positivism, positivism is often associated uh, with, with free market economics. So in terms of unraveling some of those, some of those uh, uh, ideas, uh, I gave some background. The second part is about Hayek's journey, uh, simply trying to tell the story, as I said, about the development of, of his ideas. And the final section is, to, is, is an attempt to assess his legacy. And this is a final fascinating aspect that I'd like to share with you about Hayek. Uh, everyone, as Lanny said, thought he was wrong. Today, in field after field, people are saying, gosh, he was pretty close to right. Not, not just economics. I, I attended a conference uh, at uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts over this past summer. Uh, Nobel Prize winners like Vernon Smith and Douglas North love Hayek's work. Um, but in addition, there was Gerald Edelman there, who's a Nobel Prize winner in biology, saying that Hayek's work on the sensory order, on, on, the, on, on uh, cognition and the workings of the mind, uh, he said were in, was incredible that he was getting these kinds of insights uh, you know, 50 years ago when he experimentally didn't have access to any of the, the sorts of things that they have now. And uh, uh, well, it, it's, it's just fun to work uh, on, on, on a figure uh, like that. Uh, and the final aspect that uh, I, I, in that legacy, and this is another part of why I chose the book's title, Hayek's Challenge, 
is I think uh, if we take Hayek seriously, he challenges even today uh, some of the directions uh, with, within economics. And so I think he has uh, some valuable things to say, not just in ways that you know, people acknowledge his, uh, his, his insights into the nature of socialism, but uh, into the nature of, of economic phenomena more generally. So thanks very much. Well, thank you. Guys, first of all, let me just say I have not read either one of these two books because I am already profoundly convinced they're too difficult for me. But I will, I, I am intrigued by the subject and will be picking them up shortly. Um, someplace along the line, out of frustration with an editor who knew better how my book should be titled than I did, the common uh, malady, uh, Someplace along the line, out of that frustration, I coined what is for me a personal motto. Freedom works. Uh, I think of this as sort of a practical ideology. Freedom is good and freedom works. Servitude is bad and servitude doesn't work. Uh, I don't think I'm unique in that. I think there are many of us that could go along. And I think most of us who believe in freedom as both the better practical alternative and the better moral alternative uh, would be in this generation at this time uh, pursuant to higher. I'm going to suggest to you that from the period of time 1930 to 1980 intellectual devotion to freedom was in high jeopardy in this in this country in the world this was a period of time after the Great Depression when it was easy to believe that capitalism fails and easy to believe that various forms of statism socialism communism is the better alternative it was particularly easy to believe that since you would be more likely to be trained in the latter than the former in any formal academic experience you might have I hold to a uh, conviction that the ideas of the left are both uh, superficial and audacious and therefore quite comforting to most people most of the time. The ideas of the right are both deep, uh, deep and humble and therefore less attractive to most of the people most of the time. And from the period 1930 to 1980, the ideas of the left there with their superficiality and their audacity ran rampant, certainly in America, but I'm sure across the globe. Why did I pick that time? Well, obviously, I start with uh, the 30s and the Great Depre Depression as being making it possible to see before your very eyes the failure of freedom and the success of servitude. Why do I pick 1980 for the end of this uh, period of sort of intellectual and moral malaise? Because in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States and our ideas had won. And I'll go into that. But without uh, Hayek, there wouldn't have been a Ronald Reagan. There wouldn't have been a Jack Kemp. There wouldn't have been a Dick Army. There wouldn't have been a Phil Crane. And there wouldn't be today a half a dozen or so young uh, heroes that we have in the Congress of the United States, people like uh, uh, Flake from Arizona. Uh, uh, I can name, name some uh, uh, further, but Jeff Flake is clearly the young Ryan from Wisconsin, uh, Toomey from, uh, from Pennsylvania. There wouldn't be these people. Why do I say that? I had all my formal academic training in between 1963 and 1968. I had enough academic training to have had permanent brain damage. <laughs> in all of my years of schooling, clear through to a PhD, I never saw presented to me in the classroom, and I dare say few people did, by way of any assignment or, for that matter, recommending reading anything from Hayek, von Mises, Rand, 
and very little from Schumpeter. What we got exposed to was Keynes, Keynesians, and the American Institutionalist School, which would barely qualify as worthwhile sociology if there were such a thing as worthwhile <laughs> sociology. And of course, the, uh, uh, the sort of the uh, highlight of this period of time was the works of John Kenneth Galbraith, who everybody must understand had to have known better than to believe what he wrote because he had his formal training in agricultural economics. But obviously he weren't. Galbraith I hold up as an example of where we were during this time, which, which I would call academic and uh, moral faddishness. It was easy to be popular if you were superficial and audacious. Of course, the great conflict, intellectual conflict uh, of the 20s and the 30s was between Keynes and, uh, help me out here, who did he ridicule in the in the general theory? It'll come to me. Pigou. 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 Yeah. Uh, had there been a Pigouvian revolution, we'd have been miles further. But why was Keynes? Why did he reign over Pigou? Because he ran with the beautiful people, and Pigou was a scholar, somewhat eccentric. Why? Why did Galbraith outshine? Uh, Milton Friedman in our time, because Galbraith ran with the beautiful people. You could read uh, uh, Galbraith, understand him, and appreciate him if you were committed to never thinking about it. <laughs> you couldn't get past the introduction to Friedman unless you were committed to deep, hard, and, uh, him, uh, and humbling thought. And so one of the things that I would say about Hayek, during this period of time when most of us were raised, Hayek shines through as a person of courage and conviction. It would have been so easy of a, with, for a man of his intellect to go uh, with the flow and gain all the applause. It would have been so much easier for him to, be, to have been uh, superficial and audacious and therefore easy in the classroom, easily understood, and highly regarded. It would have been so e much easier for him to have said, let me tell all the people in high office how they can empower themselves with further jurisdiction over other people and, both, and be both more effective and more morally acceptable. But he didn't do these things. He resisted all the great temptations of the time for anybody who chose to labor in academic vineyards. The great temptation to put himself, his standing, his career, his position in the community ahead of his ideas. Hayek demonstrates that a person who would have the devotion to the point that the idea is bigger than the man, the idea is bigger than the time, the idea is bigger than the moment, the idea is bigger than me. And let me serve the idea rather than allow the idea to serve me. I think we need to stop every now and then and realize there are very few her heroes in all of academia who would have the courage of their convictions to put themselves second to the ideas, to stand down from the instant, instant fame and social standing because they have a conviction about ideas. Hayek also stands out in that he gave us the breakthrough work. Most of us who discovered these deeper ideas about humility and freedom and dignity and what works and what doesn't work, most of us found our way through the road to serfdom. He was one of the few of these scholars that gave us something that the, those of us at a time when we were uninitiated could, as it were, get our teeth into, could understand, comprehend. Most of us found this book 
because of some intuition that we had, some disaffection we had with what we were being exposed to, some uh, longing for something that was deeper and more meaningful. But most of us would not have found our way beyond this book if we hadn't had this as our pathfinder. So I put the road to serfdom down as very big. One, you take a look at all of these people that we revere today, von Mises. There was no easy path except first through the road to serfdom. I remember Jack Kemp talking about how he used to read the road to serfdom in airplanes to and from football games. Take a look at the collective works of von Mises and Schumpeter and, and Hayek himself. You wouldn't find very many people capable of reading those in airplanes between football games and on buses. But the road to serfdom broke the ice. It seems to me that the, uh, the conclusion that we can come to once we find this is twofold. Capitalism is both morally and intellectually superior to any form of collectivism. I want to argue with it. Capitalism is both morally and intellectually superior to any form of collectivism. Why do I dare say this is an audacity on my part? I'm not going to be applauded in the Washington Post for having said this. I'm not going to be celebrated at Harvard or MIT or Yale or possibly maybe at Chicago, but very few places. Let me put it a little strong, more direct. All forms of collectivism are morally and intellectually inferior to capitalism. When I look at people who are devoted to collectivism, I want to say, shame on you. You know, the Lord God Almighty gave you the intellectual capacity to rise above the superficiality of what it is you're espousing. And just plain human decency and the fundamentals of just plain respect ought to give you the ability to rise above the immorality of what you espouse. The first and most important cornerstone here is freedom. Now, I don't know that von Mises, and certainly not Ayn Rand, Schumpeter, or very many of these intellectual think thinkers would connect freedom as I do to my religious conviction, but freedom is to me a gift to the Lord God Almighty. But Nobody could objectively look at the history of humankind and say that in any time, in any place, there was any value that was greater than personal liberty and individual freedom in the lives of this species that we call on earth human beings. Where does it come from? I have my own point of view. I'm sure Jane Grand would be very disappointed in me for it. But I have my own point of view of where it comes from, but nobody would dispute that it is there. Army's axiom, if you want to see a man working like a borrowed mule, watch him when he works for himself and his family. Freedom works. Capitalism, freedom, freedom of enterprise. It encourages the best we have and it, and it punishes our failings, creative destruction. Capitalism punishes immorality. And all forms of governments, even in its most necessary and benevolent form, government is fundamentally about making people do what they will not do voluntarily. And I don't know, you can take the sweetest, kindest act of government that you can think of, it is still about making somebody do what they will not do voluntarily. And if you want something that works better, have something that works because people choose freely and voluntarily to do so, and yes, because it's in their best interest to do so. And then secondly, and I think the great in insight that we get from Hayek, probably more clearly than anybody else, information. The market is the greatest information processing system in the world. Take all the computer capabilities we have in this modern and wondrous electronic age, they can't do for you what the market was doing 
a hundred years ago. Collect, sort, fragment, condense, and distribute information to the right decision maker at the right time for the right purpose for the optimal choice. Nobody can do that. And that was focused on by Hayek and brought clear. Because Hayek made this so clear in my understanding, gave me Army's axiom number one, the market's rational, the government's dumb. And I chose the word dumb shamelessly for the alliteration. There's no doubt about it. But it is not rational. It is not possible to process information. Collectivism is unworkable because it's unworkable. It can't process the basic data. Nobody can know. How do I know? I may know that the price of tea has gone up or go down, but I don't know about the flood, I don't know about the drought, I don't know about the labor unrest, I don't know and I don't care. All I got one data point given me by the market at the time I need it, when I need it, and it tells me everything, as opposed to that which was required by a central planning authority. When I uh, struggled through the university, learning against all that I was exposed to and teaching against all that I was expected to teach, the principles of ration, rational thought, rational systems, and freedom and liberty, I then eventually came to Washington. I came to Washington and I found that most of Washington, I'm sure it's true in most state governments, most of city councils, most of government is seduced by the audacities of power, the presumption of power. We can make this work our way by making you do what we ask of you. There were a few heroes of freedom that we found in Washington. First and foremost, Ronald Reagan, but certainly Jack Kemp at, a, uh, at an earlier time, uh, Phil Crane before them, and we have these heroes now. None of these people would be here without Hayek. None of them would know and understand what they know without Hayek. And I would say, as I go on now, and I look forward to my post-congressional, my post-in-government experience, I have been left more free to and more capable of advocating freedom because freedom works and able to understand, I think, what I'm talking about most of the time because of Hayek. And had I not found the road to serfdom, I would not have found any of the rest of it. So that's my great thank you to Frederick Hyde. You broke the ice for me. You gave me an insight into a world of understanding that this nation, in all of its great universities, would have denied me. And you did the same for countless others. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, some opportunity for some questions uh, from the floor. So if you wait, we have uh, microphones here that can be brought to you. If you'd identify yourself, let's start with this gentleman right here. <coughs> I'm uh, Jay Baker. Uh, my understanding is that uh, when Hayek came to the University of Chicago, uh, he did so at least in part because the president of the university, President Hutchins, was determined to have him on the faculty. But I've also heard it said that at that time, the economics department, where he might logically go, was just as determined that his place not be in that department. And so he uh, ended up on a rather peculiar, at least academically peculiar organization called the Committee on Social Thought. And I'm wondering if there's any truth to that characterization of how he came to be on the Committee on Social Thought. This is a question that is of, of some interest in, uh, among uh, uh, individuals who are interested in Hayek, and we may not have complete unanimity here, but we may. 
the um, basically, I, I don't think that it was Hutchins who was seeking to bring Hayek to Chicago. I think he supported it, but it was really John Neff, who was the head of the Committee on Social Thought, who was the real strong advocate for Hayek to come to Chicago. Um, with respect to the economics department, uh, Neff has a line in his autobiography to the effect that uh, the economists didn't want him because the road to serfdom was too popular a work for a respectable scholar to perpetrate or something along those lines. And <clears throat> I asked Milton Friedman the direct question, what, what about this line from Neff? And he was just emphatic that the road to serfdom had nothing to do with Hayek not being taken into the economics department at the University of Chicago, that basically it was more that Hayek's Austrian economic approach was not consistent with the approach at the uh, University of Chicago from a technical perspective. It wasn't an ideological question. It was more a technical question that it was just a different brand of economics that, uh, than was being practiced in the University of Chicago at that time. And that therefore, that's why I went to the Committee on Social Thought, which was a, in, in, from Hayek's perspective, <clears throat> in many ways, um, a, a much nicer position because he had more flexibility, he didn't have to teach, he could start to expand into uh, political thought, philosophy, and so forth. So that, that's my impression of Hayek's coming to Chicago. Bruce may have different views on that, so. No, I, I think that that's, uh, that's I, I agree with, uh, with Lanny's uh, description. I might just further add that uh, the Coles Commission was at Chicago at that time and these were econometricians, many of whom uh, I think would have been unhappy with the way that Hayek's work, Hayek was often very critical of empirical work. So I think that that probably would have made him suspect in their view. And in uh, the late 80s, no, early 80s, I think, uh, Hayek did an interview with Shahadi, uh, a man at the LSE, and Hayek's own view was that it was the econometricians that, that uh, were likely the ones who had opposed uh, uh, his coming in there. But you know, uh, when you're dealing with academic politics, uh, you're talking about a committee room, uh, you don't know what was actually said. Uh, even sometimes uh, th there's a wonderful book out about an incident that happened between uh, uh, Wittgenstein, uh, Wittgenstein's poker, where, uh, where all the people in the room couldn't agree on, on what happened in a famous incident. And so uh, it's, it's often quite difficult to reconstruct uh, uh, what what kind of causes may have may have come uh, come to th that kind of conclusion or led to that conclusion? Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Hankey, Johns Hopkins, and the Cato Institute. Uh, Bruce, in your remarks today, you you give the impression that uh, Hayek was switching from field to field and operating at a, at a stratospheric level in each one of these fields, and and that the, the switching was, in effect, the result of the fact that you're dealing with a unique genius, kind of. Uh, however, in the book, uh, your, your book, you indicate when Hayek was asked about that, or maybe this was one of your comments, I can't quite remember, but Hayek, in effect, said, well, we were trained to be able to do that in, in Vienna. Now, the interesting thing, of course, now the training in economics is just the opposite. You're trained to stay in the narrowest little pigeonhole in the world and, and can't move around with any flexibility. I, I wish you'd elaborate a little bit on, more on the Hayek's comment, well, we were trained to be that way because it's clear they all were. I mean, he wasn't the only rambler moving around from field to field at a very top level. But in your book, you, you just really let it just kind of drop and didn't, you didn't say anything about it. But I, I did note it and uh, agree that, that that's the truth. But I'd, I'd be curious what you have to say about that. Sure. Um, the way that the university system was set up in Vienna, uh, students would take any classes that they felt that they wanted to sit in on. And they would often just simply seek, the, the good students would seek out uh, good professors and take their classes and they would end up taking their exams at the end of a second or a third year and and it was often uh, the bad students would simply get coaches to coach them up on the exams the good students would just simply dip in lots of different fields so he had this uh, he said in, in in some of his uh, reminiscences that he was trained from that process to always feel confident in going and and learning a field uh, up himself just 
get, getting up on a field uh, uh, on his own because of that background. Uh, I'll, I'll also simply point out, and then Lenny may have some further comments on this, uh, another example of that was after his uh, a couple of years at university, he was, uh, he was getting on the nerves of one of these professors. He, he went to the professor's class and took the class, and then there was a seminar, and the professor finally kicked him out of the seminar because he kept asking these questions that were embarrassing the professor. He's smarter than the professor. And, and he was running into this sort of problem, so he and his, some friends uh, formed a, a group called the Geistkreis, uh, where they would just meet on their own, and, and typically people would give papers in areas outside their training. So he would have art historians, psychologists, economists, etc. there. And very, not always, but very often people would, would simply uh, investigate something that, that wasn't in their field, and then there'd be others who were in that field that would comment on it. So it, it was uh, really uh, uh, the Vienna coffee house culture and, and academic culture of that time is, was, was really quite wonderful, I think. Right here. I I, um, I enjoyed uh, Mr. Army's uh, division between the superficial, audacious on the one side and the deep and humble. Uh, <coughs> I think that really, really is quite valuable. Uh, but, but doesn't that raise a question? If it's true that in a democracy, in the capitalist democracy, that the superficial and audacious um, succeed for periods of time, doesn't that raise a question about whether um, the extent to which one can predict or one can depend on uh, freedom working or, or, or capitalism continuing to work. And I had two things, two things in mind that I was wondering if you could comment on. Um, one is simply people could be unwise, obviously, in who they vote for, led by the, the hopes you suggested and in the, in the, in the division you made between the, the audacious and the, and the deep and humble. And the second thing is that capitalism itself, people have argued that capitalism itself uh, is a decaying factor, politically, that, that it causes moral decay. Um, and, uh, you know, think of Tocqueville's argument. I mean, no one would call, um, fault Tocqueville for being a socialist, but he's pointed out that capitalism, uh, you know, weakens religion, uh, disrupts, dis dis disrupts ties between people, uh, coarsens people, leads to uh, all kinds of morally uh, negative effects. And you know, just thinking about Hollywood, for instance, you know, it it seems like there's some truth to that. Well, let me just say first of all, I think uh, one of the expressions I used purposefully, I hope maybe you're back. Right. I said that the uh, what passes for intellectual activity on the part of the left is superficial and audacious and comforting. I mean, here's the free lunch. There's where you're free of personal responsibility while you stretch your social responsibility. Uh, you, you're free of thinking while you emote. Uh, it is, you know, it's, you're very stylish, by the way, along the way, and subject to a great deal of applause. Uh, the, uh, it's full of seductions. On the right, uh, the, the, or on the side of freedom, these are not comfortable lessons. It's first of all, it's intellectually rigorous and demanding. It's deep thought. It's uh, it, it it requires your person uh, your personal responsibility and and it punishes immorality. Uh, there are no rewards, you know, that are unearned. You re capitalism uh, will will solicit or, or elicit the best you have to offer and reward you accordingly and punish you for your failings. So it's not a very comfortable thing. The, the biggest problem though you have is people love freedom, governments love power. Now the problem you have is once, once people get into positions of public authority and, and power is they then rationalize is the imposition of their better judgment and their jurisdiction in the lives of others because of what's good for them. The two great audacities of big government are one, that you are incapable and therefore the government must protect you from your foolishness. Uh, and, or two, you are not ethical and therefore the government must protect others. Now, you look on, uh, take Washington as an example. 
how many uh, how many examples of intellectual and moral accomplishment do you find in the government of the United States from which you would model your life in the performance of their official duties as compared to in the private sector, in the home, in the church. As far as capitalism threatening uh, religious value, I, 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 my own view is uh, quite the contrary. I, I personally will tell you the reason people in any generation, in any culture, at any time in the history of the world, value personal liberty so high is because personal liberty is a unique gift from the Lord God Almighty to people, not to dumb animals. And somehow, at some level, we know this and we, we treasure it. So I, my own view is capitalism will foster religion if, if, if lit out freely, complement religion, encourage religion, not certainly not work against it. I'm going to jump the queue for a moment and pose a question for our uh, presenters about uh, the Hayekian research agenda, if you will. Hayek organizes much of his life about a set of questions or problems that he faced rather than answers that he already knew. His work in monetary theory, the trade cycle, he was interested in explaining trade cycles. He wanted to understand how markets and prices worked. He was deeply concerned about why intellectuals were so attracted to power and collectivism, and he inaugurated his Abuse of Reason project. His later work in understanding spontaneous orders and applying the idea more broadly beyond merely markets, but to all sorts of other institutions. Um, if you were to think about what would be big problems or questions that someone influenced by this tradition would want to undertake, and let's say I limit you to two, uh, what would they be? Do you mean current questions? Or? Yeah. I have in mind, uh, if you I look out, I see a number of uh, graduate students in the audience. Uh, what are some of the sorts of things they might devote the next oh, 40 years to? <laughs> <laughs> to think in Hayekian time uh, I could use some help with the Hayek collected works, actually. So, I mean, that, would be, that would be fine. But uh, more seriously, uh, you know, I, I see Hayek not as starting a Hayekian tradition in <laughs> economics, per se. Rather, I see Hayek as contributing to a much broader uh, tradition uh, in which people who are doing work in public choice, uh, in transactions, cost analysis, property rights theory, uh, history of ideas, uh, Vernon Smith's work, the new institutional economics with Doug North. I mean, I mentioned North and, and, and Vernon Smith. These are two people who, who have a great deal of respect for Hayek and define in some ways the sorts of research that they're doing uh, in a very Hayekian framework. So rather, I, I, I would want to rephrase your, your question to, to say, you know, what, which of, where would Hayek fit into this larger tradition? I think it's a tradition that has, uh, is very complementary to what often passes as the mainstream in economics. It's not meant to supplant it so much as to say, well, there's a bunch of questions that this other tradition is just simply uh, not focusing on or perhaps the tools are not uh, the, the right tools for addressing these questions. And, and uh, Hayek uh, and others within that, that alternative tradition, I think, uh, uh, provide some of those tools and questions. Two areas. I think it's an excellent question. Um, one is the application of <clears throat> the idea that government shouldn't micromanage the economy to government shouldn't micromanage morality. And I think this follows up on Mr. Army's <coughs> comments that <clears throat> I, I'd agree that if you give people freedom, they'll choose a more conservative social order. And the problem in our society now is that there are so many institutions and public policies that prevent people from choosing that more conservative social order. So I think the application of Hayek's ideas from economics to uh, issues of uh, social, more, more general social policy would be one area. The, the second area, which I think is a fascinating area of Hayek's research program, is the whole idea of unarticulated or nonverbal knowledge, how knowledge is communicated. And, and, and these are just wonderful ideas that Hayek himself did not develop as much as he could have. But the whole idea of how n knowledge is communicated and, and nonverbal knowledge in particular is communicated through institutions, I think would be another area. I, I agree. I mean, to me, the, you can start with Adam Smith's invisible hand, a mystery. You know, 
uh, Schumpeter's creative destruction, destruction or, or if you, as we now know in greater depth, the price system, and the price is that data point, uh, that single data point that condemns reams of knowledge. I don't think we fully understand uh, understand this at all, but I think we we have standing on the shoulders of these folks uh, the, in, the, in, the inescapable understanding that that freedom and that free flow of information, that automatic, mysterious sorting and collecting and condensing and distributing of data can never be matched. And I think it's very important because we went through a period of time with our computers that we thought, oh, we could do it now with computers. But, you know, we can take all the computer capability in the world and we cannot match it. It is truly a miracle. And so, I, I mean, I usually often use the expression, the miracle of the market is how it gets all the right information to the right people at exactly the right moment so they can make the, the decision. Think this, the next time you sit down and make a decision, go to lunch tomorrow and decide what you're going to eat, look at the prices. Look at all the information in the world about that handful of little choices you don't have, don't need, don't want, and would never bother yourselves with. Central planner can't ignore that information, only you can. Back there. I'm Dane von Breikenrecord with the U.S. Yep. Testing, one, two, three. Okay. Hi, I'm Dane von Breikenrecord with the United States Bill of Rights Foundation, and uh, it seems like the underlying theme of this talk is, is certainly about capitalism and liberty. And my question goes primarily, I guess, to Mr. Army, but I, I, I thought all of you could comment on it. Mr. Army, I know that you're interested in the flat tax and you've been promoting that idea, but I would like to ask all of you, what liberty, and particularly, uh, Mr. Army, you mentioned the dignity of liberty and freedom, and I'd like for you all to address what dignity and liberty is there when individuals on the 15th of April every year have to be like little minions shaking in their boots, putting their tax returns in the mailbox, and almost a pathological fear of an agency of the government called the Internal Revenue Service. And I was wondering if maybe you could address the possibility of getting, and by the way, under capitalism, what capitalist idea is it, and do you think it is a good one, to tax the wages of labor, that that should be a site for, uh, for, for, for a tax base. So if you could address it from the capitalist point of view, should we be taxing wages and under the liberty and dignity, uh, the, the process of, of, of literally opening your life up and explaining yourself to the government, uh, uh, what's supposed to be a servant government, uh, why you don't see that as a reversal of role where government should be reportable to the people, not the other way around. Thank you. Let me also add, if you could tie it somehow to Hayek's life and thought. Well, uh, <coughs> first of all, I think, I mean, even, even the most devoted libertarian, I imagine he's in this room, would have to acknowledge that some government is necessary. You got to have a system of justice, you have some, some system of order, some police and protection, whatever. To the extent that some government to, prov to provide order I is necessary, that government must be funded. That government should be, it will be funded by imposing taxes. Then you come down to the question, what is the most civilized and respectful way to do that? Uh, the reason I go with a flat tax is one, it, uh, it removes the two great audacities that give you this nightmare that frightens people to death. The two great uh, corruptions of the current American tax code are one, income redistribution, and two, social engineering. Now, there's only one legitimate reason to, to have a tax code, that is to raise money. That's the only possible legitimate reason you can have for doing it. So you should do it in the simplest, most direct way possible. Uh, my idea of fairness is to treat every dollar's worth of income exactly the same as every other dollar's, irrespective of whether it's earned from the provision of land, labor, or capital through the production process. Uh, they're all three essential components of production. They should all three be taxed accordingly. Uh, 
if, if there's an indignity with that you face on on April 15, that dignity is first born out of the fact that we have a government that's grown far beyond what is either necessary or productive in your life, and therefore it must be funded. And, and the, then the audacities of control that I mentioned of income redistribution and social engineering that further complicate your life and intimidate you. But it is not impossible to have a civilized tax system if we can have a civilized government. Okay, we have time for I think just two more relatively quick questions. This gentleman here. Uh, hi, my name is Ted Gebhard. Um, I don't remember which, but either Mr. Caldwell or Mr. Ebenstein um, mentioned that Von Wieser was Hayek's uh, principal teacher in Vienna as a young man. Um, if I remember correctly, um, Von Wieser's uh, contributions to technical economics fall in kind of the areas of opportunity cost and, uh, and margin. And, and and pushing the idea of marginalism uh, forward. But he was anything uh, in his political philosophy, um, uh, anything but a, uh, but a classical, 19th century classical liberal. Um, as Hayek's principal teacher, how did Hayek come to depart so far from, from von Wieser in his own philosophical outlook? Uh, yeah, I was the one who mentioned von Wieser. Uh, that's right. Well, the young Hayek was uh, was basically a social democrat. Uh, he was uh, uh, <coughs> walked by and sat in on some of von Mises's classes and thought von Mises was just too extreme. Uh, so you know, early on, he he was he was a, a good a good leftist college student. Uh, his experience, though, with von Mises. Uh, was I think probably uh, definitive in, in, in getting him, as he put it, gradually to change his mind. Because he didn't, he, what he said was he didn't like the way von Mises put things, but he, as he thought about the arguments, he thought that the arguments were right. And uh, it, he worked with von Mises in a government office uh, after the war, and so got to see him in, in that context. Uh, and he, uh, in, in addition to working alongside of him, uh, von Mises's book on socialism came out uh, when Hayek knew him, and he apparently had the manuscript in the drawer while they were working uh, side by side. And then finally, after his trip to the United States, uh, he came back and, and joined uh, von Mises's circle, uh, the Mises Kreis. And and I think it was that period of, of about a decade in the 1920s that he uh, that he his views uh, 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 gradually changed. Um, so. Thanks. Uh, Julian Sanchez, Reason Magazine. Uh, Mr. Coldwell mentioned Hayek's cousin Wittgenstein, uh, who was also in his own way sort of obsessed with rules and order. Uh, I wonder if you have anything to add to uh, John Gray's sort of tragically short discussion of the strong affinities between their thought. Uh, in particular, the extent to which a, a Wittgensteinian strain in Hayek's thinking is in tension with the highly reductionist uh, account of human behavior that is at the foundation of von Mises' uh, theory. Um, I, John Gray is, a, is an interesting uh, uh, person uh, uh, whose, whose views on Hayek have, have been uh, in lots of different places uh, changing over time. Uh, and in, in, in my estimation, his views have, have, have deteriorated uh, uh, of late. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's difficult uh, uh, for me to uh, uh, to make much sense of, of some of the things he says. Now, the particular argument that you're referring to, though, is not one that I've, I'm familiar with. I'm afraid. So, uh, what was his claim exactly? If you if you could again, you get a microphone I mean, over there, please. Well, just that there were certain parallels between, uh, for example, Wittgenstein's emphasis on uh, the idea that uh, uh, rule systems uh, are, not, are not subject to uh, a certain kind of foundational analysis, that, for example, it made no sense to think of set theory as providing a foundation for mathematics, um, uh, the sense in which rule following at some level uh, just represents a will to go on in a certain way rather than 
uh, expressing. And was he attributing Hayek's ideas about this to his study of Wittgenstein? Is that is that the the point that he Gray's was making? suggesting that there was an affinity. I don't know whether he. I don't recall. Right. He I mean, I think this, this is there. The similarities in their views have been mentioned uh, by other writers, and I, this is actually one of the real uh, interesting, uh, but occasionally pitfall sorts of things with. Uh, with trying to do intellectual history is, is very often people want to attribute influence when there's certain similarities in, in people's thought. And it, uh, it, it isn't my view that, that in anything that I've come across that Wittgenstein was an influence. Of course, they were cousins. I mean, they were distant cousins, Hayek and Wittgenstein. So he knew of, of Wittgenstein's work. But uh, as far as I know, uh, you know, I haven't seen anything that would that would lead me to believe that that Hayek was so influenced, although the similarities might be there. I can I make a quick comment too. <clears throat> and once again, because you mentioned you're from Reason, I believe that uh, either in late 1974 or early 1975, Reason published an interview with Hayek, um, where he's asked about the influence of Wittgenstein on his thought. And his response is something to the effect, well, there are a number of stimulating ideas, and it's very interesting, but that it, it, he didn't think it really influenced him that much. So uh, I, I think Gray overestimates the influence of, of Wittgenstein on Hayek. OK, well, I, let me just make uh, one comment about what an inspiration Hayek has been to people all around the planet. I remember I went to a birthday party for him at the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Vienna. And two Czechs came up uh, during the, when they were still under communism, and very quietly said, uh, Ich bin Hayekian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because they had the copies of his books in a photocopy and some is not uh, translations that they would pass carefully from hand to hand. And they came to Vienna hoping to find other people interested in these ideas and fortunately stumbled across a birthday party uh, for Hayek that was being held by the grandson of Rudolf Hilferding who is the great Marxist in Vienna, and his uh, grandson uh, is a classical liberal and has been doing a great deal to resurrect interest in that Austrian tradition of liberalism. Before we go upstairs uh, for a uh, toast and some refreshments upstairs to uh, toast Hayek's memory, I'd like to point out there are copies of the books available for sale out here. For anyone else, Amazon.com or laissezfairebooks.com, you can get them there as well. So I hope you'll join me in thanking our presenters for st very stimulating programs. <laughs>